All right, ECMO for everyone. How many of you guys are using ECMO regularly? Yep. How many of you guys would occasionally see an ECMO patient? Just about everybody. So what I'm going to do now is, for the most part, review some of the um, basics of ECMO, um, talking about what it is, why we do it, how we do it, um, and as we said, culminating in a, a demonstration of, of eCPR uh, in relation to the two-cheer trial that we've been, again, collaborating with uh, RPA on. So what is it? Well, Paul has already uh, pointed out to you the CardioHelp machine, which we also have down here. It's nothing more than a fancy pump. Um, it's going to take blood out of the body, oxygenate it, and put it back into the body. Um, why do we do it? Well, as we saw on the referral criteria uh, that Paul put up, we're doing it for severe cardiac or respiratory failure that is unresponsive to conventional therapy. So patients who are failing ventilation with an ARDS type picture, patients with cardiomyopathy or, or, or uh, a, uh, a shocked state um, that may require uh, more than um, more than catecholamines and, and uh, vasopressors. Two types, more or less, veno arterial and veno venous. So we've said ECMO is nothing more than a pump that takes blood out of a big vein, often. Uh, it's placed in a, in a femoral vein and puts it back in either to a vein, in the case of vena venous, or an artery, in the case of vena arterial. If we take blood out of the body and we oxygenate it and we put it back into a vein, we're essentially bypassing the lungs. So VV ECMO is lung bypass. It's lung rest. It allows us to get oxygen to the patient without using their native lungs. VA, you take blood out of the body from a big vein, you oxygenate it and you put it back into an artery, usually the femoral artery, um, with a pressure. So you're providing oxygenated blood and a blood pressure to the patient. You have cardiopulmonary bypass. And really that's where ECMO has evolved from um, and you can run full cardio cases on uh, a cardio help machine not that too many people do how do we do it so the physical technique of doing it you're probably all familiar with already how many of you guys would use a seldinger technique regularly in your uh, work just about everyone so it's a Seldinger technique, a bit like putting a chest drain into a femoral vessel. So I'm going to pass this around. It's a big ECMO cannula. They're not all that big, but a wire goes into the vessel, serial dilatation, and then the cannula is placed and it's connected up to the circuit. Who do we do? Now, no matter how much grandma, doubly incontinent, from the nursing home begs, don't put her on. We know that ECMO is a very invasive, very expensive, um, uh, very resource consuming intervention. And so we have to be quite discerning in who we choose to put on and who we don't. And I think uh, good results, as, as Paul has uh, shown us, are in part due to good patient selection. Um, in terms of retrieval, that begins with a call to the MRU where we're then communicating with the 
um, hospital that is referring and an ECMO specialist to see if there's anything that we can do to optimise them conventionally or transport them conventionally. Um, and uh, um, if not, send the team out to, uh, to pick them up. In terms of ECMO CPR that we will be looking at in the context of the two cheer protocol, um, age is a very important criteria um, and patients over 70 just don't get on. Um, patients who are in asystole, uh, patients who didn't have a witnessed arrest, um, patients who've not had bystander CPR, patients with um, significant comorbidities that mean that recovery to their previous functional status is unlikely, and patients with advanced care directives, obviously. Complications, bad shit does happen, um, and uh, I've certainly been involved in a case of a, a, an eCPR uh, on a lady who was on a Pixaban, and the groin looked much like that. Uh, so immediate complications often have to do with the cannulation, uh, so bleeding, hematoma, kinked wires, um, uh, damage to femoral vessels, femoral nerves, uh, exsanguination into the retroperitoneum, putting the patient on AA ECMO, which does very badly. Um, all of these things have happened. Then there are the longer term complications, which also have to do with bleeding and clotting. And then of course, infection. If you can imagine 52 days on ECMO, big pipes, tubes, etc. Uh, infection is, is really our, our, uh, our enemy. Along with all of the complications of, of a chronic ICU state. So ECMO in and of itself doesn't really treat anything. <coughs> ECMO isn't anything more than a bridge. ECMO is a way of maintaining the patient's physiology, keeping them alive until we're able to treat a reversible cause or allow the body to heal itself. And that may take 600 days if you're in America. And uh, as Jeff said, I wonder what the bill was. So VV ECMO. We can see here we have a a uh, chest x-ray with four quadrant infiltrate, almost rock solid lungs. This patient was getting tidal volumes of 20, 30 mils. Obviously not survivable. We know from the CESAR trial that, and uh, from our case series that ECMO support for respiratory failure patients or referral to an ECMO centre is associated with improved survival. Now there's no randomised controlled trial to say that that's the case, but it makes sense that if your lungs look like that, unless you've got some other way of getting oxygen in, you're going to die. So here's a case. Many of you will be familiar with Club Mona. Some of you even uh, have the luxury of working with that view. Uh, this is a, a case of a young boy just earlier this year during our flu season. He was 18 uh, years old, just getting ready to sit his HSC. Uh, he had a 24-hour history of a flu-like illness and he presented to the ED essentially in extremis. He was intubated in the emergency department and immediately they were struggling to ventilate him. North Shore's, uh, sorry, um, Mona, Mona Vale's retrieval centre is North Shore, the referral centre is North Shore. So they referred to North Shore and he was transported conventionally. But it very quickly became apparent that he wasn't going to be able to be ventilated. And so North Shore gave us a call at St Vincent's in order to arrange an ECMO retrieval. He was placed on uh, femoro jugular uh, ECMO, so taking blood out of the femoral artery, uh, femoral vein, excuse me, and putting it back 
into the uh, jugular vein uh, and this stops the problem of recirculation uh, to a large degree. If you imagine you've got two cannulas sitting in the IVC, you may find that if their tips are very close together, you're just circulating blood round in a circle rather than giving it back to the patient. Whereas if you're taking it out from the bottom and putting it back in from the top, pulls within the, uh, uh, the right ventricle, goes through the lungs and is delivered to the patient. He was transported uneventfully to St Vincent's and spent about a month on uh, uh, VV ECMO with significant complications of, of uh, pneumothoraces uh, and empyema. He turned out to have an influenza with a superimposed staphylococcal pneumonia. He's since made a full recovery. He's back at school um, and uh, back even to playing soccer. VA ECMO. We've said VA ECMO is essentially, essentially cardiopulmonary bypass. It's giving you heart and lung support. And its most, uh, most well evidenced um, indication is cardiogenic shock, particularly uh, cardiogenic shock from something like myocarditis. Um, this is. Um, Robin. Robin's a UK uh, visitor who developed a myocarditis while on uh, a holiday here in Australia. He's awake. His heart's actually not beating at all at this point. He said that the periods of asystole were disconcerting. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can see, he's awake. He's participating in physiotherapy. Indeed, when Robin arrived, he was profoundly shocked. Still awake, but profoundly shocked. Mottled, blue, but still talking. We opted to cannulate him awake because we were worried that just by uh, intubating him, he would have arrested. So we talked him through it. We used a good amount of local. We cannulated him up. 20 minutes after going on ECMO, Robin was sitting up in bed asking for the Wi-Fi password. He spent 12 days on VA ECMO, was decannulated, went back to the UK and, as far as I know, continues to live a normal life. This is just a, a little graph showing the um, survival in patients who receive ECMO support versus those that don't with cardiogenic shock. Again, this is not randomised controlled data. It's all very much observational. But it does stand to reason that if, you're, if your heart's not working, using something um, that gives you a blood pressure and oxygenated blood is likely to improve your survival. Just last week, I went out to pick this guy up and some of you may well have been involved in his retrieval. Um, he had taken uh, over a hundred slow release diltiazem tablets, um, was on uh, octuple strength adrenaline, noradrenaline, high dose insulin, uh, euglycemic therapy, got methylene blue, all in a hospital uh, not too far from here um, and uh, quite early in the piece because the toxicologist rightly uh, decided that this was the way that it was going we were involved from an ECMO retrieval perspective uh, so we were able to mobilize and and be there uh, while his map was still uh, in the 50s um, we put some pretty big pipes in and ran about six litres of flow, which is quite a bit. And his map improved to a whopping 55. Um, he was transported to uh, St Vincent's and came off ECMO yesterday. Brain seems to be okay. He's moving everything, not yet to commands, but we'll see how he goes. ECPR. This is one of the early... 
uh, pictures in our Catholic hospital of uh, the ECPR scenario with the cardiac surgeon <coughs> presiding over the situation. The uh, emergency physician, intensivist, perfusionist, nursing staff all marveling at the wonders of the machine. No one really paying too much attention to poor old Lazarus. We've come a, a long way since then and, and I think that the two cheer trial has really forced us to put very solid protocols in place with uh, clearly defined roles um, and a, a, a streamlined almost pit crew approach to uh, getting someone from the curbside to the uh, the ECMO machine perfusing uh, and off to the cath lab to treat their reversible cause. But does it work? Again, the evidence is rubbish and we're trying to uh, contribute to that. There are also uh, internationally a number of randomised controlled trials uh, going on of um, uh, ECMO CPR for both in hospital and out of hospital cardiac arrest. Um, you can see that more or less the limited ev evidence we have favours eCPR. So 10 studies included, 600 cases, neurologically intact survival favours eCPR. You may have heard about the, two, the, the CHEER trial. This was the trial done uh, at the Alfred in Melbourne. Um, CHEER standing for CPR, hypothermia, ECMO and early reperfusion uh, for patients with refractory cardiac arrest. Less than 70 years old, out of hospital VF arrest, no ROSC for greater than 30 minutes and a presumed reversible cause. Some say that the results of the CHIA trial are a bit too good to be true. They suggest 50% neurologically intact survival for out of hospital cardiac arrest. If that's true, that's spectacular. The registry data uh, from the uh, ELSO database, which is an international de database of uh, uh, ECMO centres, suggests more on the order of about 30%. Uh, so I'm not saying that the Alfred guys are lying, but um, we had to do two cheer just to make sure, particularly because it was done in Melbourne and we can't really have them showing us up. So we're aiming for 51%. Um, we'll see what happens and maybe Paul give us an update on, on uh, where we are with the, the data on that in the, uh, in the afternoon. So I'm going to talk you through now uh, one of the earlier cases uh, of, of ECPR at St Vincent's. Um, this is Jean-Paul. Uh, Jean-Paul was visiting us from uh, France uh, and he collapsed in Castlereagh Street in the CBD. Now, by the end of it all, he'd had no ROSC for one hour. Uh, that's one hour of uh, good quality ALS. And I'd imagine that most of you in the room would be calling it probably well before that. But this is how it went down. 758, initial call, bystander CPR in progress. Paramedics were on scene very quickly. They defibrillated him, placed an LMA and put the Lucas on as part of the two cheer protocol. He was loaded in the ambulance and arrived at St Vincent's in under an hour from the time of his collapse. As this was going on, they called to King's Cross ER. If anyone wants to see how not to perform an emergency room thoracotomy, watch this. Uh, it's awesome. Um, so the uh, paramedics phoned through while they were on scene uh, that there was a potential two-chair candidate coming through. Um, a single phone call activated the entire ECMO team, which involves uh, ED, ICU, uh, perfusion, uh, cardiac anaesthetics, a uh, large group of people who converge on the ED and we were all there before the patient arrived. Roles were distributed uh, and you guys will see as we go along we have uh, pre-printed uh, role allocation cards. We use transesophageal echo to make sure that the Lucas is in the right place and also to confirm uh, 
um, whether there are any reversible causes. This is him in uh, VF. He was shocked, but again, there's no return of spontaneous circulation. So back on the Lucas and we're checking to see if he meets the inclusion criteria. So he's less than 70, it was witnessed. He got bystander CPR, it was less than 60 minutes since the time of collapse. Um, his initial rhythm was VF and he doesn't have any known organ failures. Now often that's very hard to know in an ECPR situation, um, but uh, he did not have anything known. Cannulation started at 8.50. And by 908, he had ROSC. So we often find that once you put the patient on, you've got a bit of perfusion of the coronaries that previously, uh, uh, that rhythm that previously was not reverting with shocks reverts. So we'll do up to th three shocks after going on ECMO uh, to see if we can get them back into a perfusing rhythm. He went to the cath lab. We opened his RCA. See a big ECMO cannula running right up his IVC there. Day one, heart's beating well. Decannulated, sitting up, happy as Larry. Of course, if he'd stayed in Paris, he could have had it done in the Louvre, which I think is much more sexy. And this is what it looks like in one of our uh, run through simulations. So this is how we practice for two cheer. Some of you will have been involved in these uh, scenarios in the past. And we're going to be doing a live demonstration uh, next up. ALS continuing in the ambulance. So ruling out any criteria that are going to make us stop. Simple selding a technique, putting your tress drain into the femoral artery and vein. Sometimes it's a bit bloody. Connecting up to ECMO, starting the flow, moving to the cath lab. So we talked about VA, VV ECMO and ECMO CPR. We've talked about the indications being severe respiratory, severe cardiac failure or indeed cardiac arrest in the right circumstances. Um, we've said that the ECMO machine is nothing more than a pump and an oxygenator and it's really not outside the skill set of most people in this room to uh, put someone on or potentially manage a patient on ECMO in the short term. This is the reason that we do it. So these patients have all survived well. Uh, and gone back to normal lives. Um, they've been retrieved or resuscitated um, with ECMO and without the device would not have survived. Um, I challenge you to tell me which one of these five people had the ECMO. All of them. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct, Cliff. <laughs> There's actually this lovely lady here and she was on for well over a month and a half, uh, VV ECMO. She um, uh, required transport from um, Tweed Heads 
hospital. She developed uh, an influenza uh, pneumonia uh, following the birth of this little one, so immediately postpartum. Uh, we transported her uh, down to uh, St Vincent's uh, and she has made a, a full recovery as well. Lots of happy stories. If you want to do any more ECMO related uh, playing, we run lots of courses. Have a look at the website. Um, any questions? Thank you guys. I think it's morning tea. <laughs>